Another thing I have to buy. I am streaming. Yeah, I'm gonna buy a tent anyway, probably because I feel I like found the best pers- two person tent on Amazon. You know, there's an Amazon Basics tent. No, I'm not getting that. So I, because I, <laughs> I used to ha- camp a lot as a kid and hike a lot and stuff. So my mom has all my old stuff, but the technology has gotten way better because like material sciences. So on Amazon, they, Amazon actually had a tent, like special tent buying guide thing with, with check boxes and helps you buy a tent. Yeah, but I think what I'll do is there's a like fancy sports place right by my office. So I might just go there because I looked, and they have, like, really ultra-portable two-person tents. The tents on Amazon were pretty ultra-portable. They tell you the dimensions. That one of them was, like, 5 by 24 or something. I don't know why you wanted me to turn the AC off. Now it's, like, 100 degrees in here. Oh, it's so nice right it's now. It's so hot in here. It's not even I'm already hot. sweating. You're just really old, I think, is what's going on. It's just normal right now. <laughs> it's totally normal. It's room temperature in here. It could well, be wa- it, technically, it'll always be room temperature. I want, no it to be, I want it to be warmer. This is, the room. this is not warm enough right now. It could be cooler when I'm sitting doing a podcast. I'm fine. Anyway, I'll just start this. Here we go. <laughs> it's Monday, July 24th, 2017. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we're talking about passwords. Mm. Hunter 5. Hunter 2, was it? Hunter 2 or Hunter 5? Whatever that old text was. I gotta look it up now. I think it was Hunter 2. Yep, Hunter 2. Oh, there's already five people watching. All right. Why was that? How many people are watching? Five stupid people. Sad lives. Up oh, down to four. I think it chased someone away. Yeah. All right. Ah, uh, do I have an opening bit? I died. <laughs> because you were complaining about slow people in the forum, I had that, that issue with Schnippers last week. I, I, I want to go to Schnippers right now because you said that. Yeah, they walk. I walked out. Like, I wanted my burger, but I walked out because of those people. I got opening bit. All right, you got one? All right, mm-hmm. let's go. Uh, and go. So it's been a long time since I've talked about Stu Leonard on this show. Yeah, you know, once we stopped living upstate, like, don't go to Stu Leonard as often. Well, I mean, so when I was a kid, we went, and it was like a special deal, right? Because, yeah. like, Stu Leonard was the fancy grocery store before there was Trader Joe's or any other fancy place, right? It was pretty much supermarket, and Stu Leonard was another thing. It was completely different. It was like the Ikea of grocery stores. And when I worked in Yonkers... I literally worked, like, right next to the one there. Mm -hmm. So I would stop there on the way home to Beacon, like, once a week. Well, but it was only one. When I was a kid, there was only one in Connecticut. And then they opened (laughs) up a few more. There's still not that many. You only can go to it if you're in New York, Connecticut kind of area. The most important part about Sue Leonard's is that turkey chili. But anyway, you mean the chicken chili with beans? Whatever it was, it was. It was oh, that's what I I guess that's what what I'm going to eat because that's in my fridge. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, I haven't been to one since in, like, super long time. Because I don't have a car. I used to, when I would drive from Beacon to Connecticut, I would pass by the one in Danbury off 84. Uh, but I haven't been to one in so long. So I went to one uh, yesterday, no, Saturday, and the Yonkers one. And it's pretty much the same as it was, was before. You know, they had all, like, the same foods that they've always had, that gorgonzola salad. Oh, that gorgonzola chili, salad. And the, pretty much everything that they, you know. The thing they, is, I just make that salad now. Yeah, but they sell, like, the full filet mignon. It's like they sell everything they always sold. I didn't notice a lot of new stuff there. You can still scoop pistachio nuts nah. with a scoop, right? I saw you were eating some of those pistachios, but obviously you wouldn't bring this up if there wasn't something different. Yeah, so the thing that Stu Leonard's is most known for, which is the reason it was a special occasion to go there when I was a kid in the 80s, 90s, whatever, is that the store is full of animatronic shit. Like like Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah, pretty much. Like, you know, the Confederate dog and uh, cow Uh-oh. guys Uh-oh. singing, right? And the... Uh, um, you know, this, the milk carton singing and the Chiquita banana singing and the cow that you push the button and it goes moo yep. and all that stuff. So the one in Yonkers, I'd actually never been to that one before, but that's the one we went to. And it had way less animatronic shit. I guess that's better than I than in the past. The only thing that was in there was a, a singing tree from Poland spring water. Nah. <laughs> uh, the, the dog and cow singing with the banjo and the, right. The civil war dog and cow. And there were a few of those, you know, like monkeys that keep flipping over a bar over and over again. But I, they, I, they the they monkey in the bar is in this video right here. They didn't have the cow that goes moo when you push the button. They didn't have the singing milk cartons. They didn't have any of that stuff. So it's like, 
I think the most of that stuff was always at the original Westport, Connecticut location. Well, the, I feel like that the is original an location of like the but, '90s mall animatronics era. But it was before the '90s. This stuff, right? It was, you know. And then it, it's, it's more like Stu Leonard is more like a Casa Bonita with the diving. Uh, it's like it was they had a unique thing that only they had. But that thing has been toned down in this, these other locations. Well, there's only two alternatives. I'm not sure what's changed in the many years since I've been there. With animatronics, because at amusement parks, at malls, and I guess it's Stu Leonard's, there's only two ways animatronics can go. Either they get scaled back over time because that's ancient, archaic technology, mm -hmm. or they become decrepit. Mm -hmm. you, and I guess you can keep maintaining them and scaling them up. I don't know. I feel like there's... Yeah, I have an expert person. I feel like there is no interest in the world that... I feel like animatronics are a dying art that will just disappear. So I think it actually, you know, it seems like, at, you know, at the, the one kind of logic is like they have it because it's quirky, right? Just because. Yep. And then you get rid of it because we're spending money on this thing that obviously isn't increasing our business. It's just costing us money, right? But I think in the day of internet, you actually want to have that thing because it gives you a reason... To go to the grocery store. Ah, but you would That's craft not just, you know, uh, Fresh Direct. You would craft it a little bit differently then. You would want to craft it in such a way that people there would have a reason to do meme nonsense around it and yeah. spread it around. I think it just makes your store into a, you know, you get tourists to come to your store, which is just a regular grocery store. The thing is about Stu Leonard is that even back in the day, even if you lived close to it, it would be weird to use that as your everyday grocery store. Yeah. Because you got to walk along this path, which very little opportunities to cut across, like Ikea, where you have to go along the path and see everything. It's like that. You can't just go in, get an egg, and come out. You got to go through the whole store and pass all the things. And if I recall correctly, when we would go, we would buy a lot of nonsense. But on our path. The other thing about Stu Leonard's is that you only when you go there, you pretty much only buy Stu Leonard brand stuff because that's the reason you're going there is to get stuff that they have that no one else has. You don't go there to get like brand name stuff because they overcharge up the ass, <laughs> right? <laughs> Big time. It's like you go in there and it's like, oh, bag of chips, five dollars, and then you go over and it's like, oh, another bag of chips for five dollars, but these are Stu's made in store daily. Kettle soup, sweet potato chips, and it's like yeah. If you buy some Lay's, you're doing right, it wrong. It's, it's like all right, I'll give you fucking five dollars for a bag of giant <laughs> amazing chips, but them Lay's for five dollars, you can shove that where the sun don't shine. <laughs> well, the sun don't shine in my mouth, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not putting Lay's in my mouth. So yeah, anyway, in the news, there's a bunch of like little newses that I think are worth mentioning. And I think first off is that this is a little bit old, but it's probably moderately important because if you're not aware, there's a lot of ways to encode video. Like mm -hmm. if you and the like, you might look at the extensions. It's on a, a lot video crazier file. than and like image encoding because you know you have a JPEG. It's named JPEG. It tell you know the file extensions map one to one yep. with the kind of file. But with videos, you have containers. And encoding, and you you kind of encode the audio and the video with two different codecs. Yep. And you can do all sorts of crazy combinations. And they have to be interleaved usually. And there's, yeah. Uh, there's lots. And of this nonsense. is why things like VLC are not, you know, are important because they get that shit playing right no matter yep. what. And there's lots of ways to encode video. And one of the more recent like pushes forward is H.265 and all the stuff under that. Mm -hmm. But Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon are at least working together ostensibly to use a royalty-free format that they're calling AV1 that should perform similarly, if not better, than H.265, but more importantly, quote, will be licensed under royalty-free terms for all use cases. Mm -hmm. That's extra important because... Uh, they want people to make devices and software that lets you watch Amazon, Netflix, and whatever. So, like, and unless they, unless if it's just one of those services, people aren't going to have an incentive to implement it. But if it's like, oh, this is the thing that every service is using, we better create decoders for this and put them in all of our products. Well, like, I have a camcorder that'll record uh, ABC. And now, HD. if you start up some other video service and you don't use this codec, you might find that people can't use your service because that your videos don't play. It's there. not just that though, because one of the biggest reasons why a lot like there's been so much trouble especially say in the 90s and early 2000s was that to make any codex better you'd just be violating someone's patent mm -hmm. and there was basically no way to innovate in that space and even big companies 
but they'd have sort of this mutually assured destruction of equal and opposing patents, and they'd sort of just come to this unsteady Cold War truce. Mm -hmm. So open codex basically remove the primary source of friction for a lot of the media industry. So unless you're Sony in the old days, you have a vested interest in removing that friction because it'll help your competitors, but it'll also help you and you'll all just make more well, money. The other thing is that all of these companies with the big, big video game like YouTube and such, right? They use so much fucking bandwidth. So even if they can get... Uh, so much CPU as well. That's, right. like, that's not but, a trivial concern. No. But the point is, even a small savings, a tiny savings, like of a fraction of a percent, multiplied by all the videos they have and all the videos they send out, will save them uh, more money than you have in like a day. Right? So, because so my example. if they team up to improve Codex... With more brain power, they can make a be even better codec that squishes things even smaller without losing quality, and thus all of them will save even more money. Whereas if they just worked on their own codecs mm -hmm. individually, none of them would be as good. So but the all use cases part is probably the most important part because my camcorder, at least one of my camcorders, it has it uses AVC HD. Like mm -hmm. that's the thing it uses. Old, but, and, old and crappy. Yeah, but that it was the state of the art when I bought that camcorder. Yeah, it has its uses still. Yeah, it does. Especially, but uh, and I have other cameras that use other codecs or have different options. But most of the cameras I own have notes buried in the manuals that came with them saying things like, you have a license to use this list of codecs for home personal use only. Technically, you can't use these, tra these transitionary formats from a lot of consumer or prosumer devices in a commercial endeavor. And most people don't worry about those things, don't think about those things, but technically, like... By using that camcorder in certain situations, like in a monetized video on YouTube, I may or may not have been violating. No, it's because you transcoded it in Adobe Media Encoder before you put it on YouTube. Uh, and then you're not even using that codec. YouTube is, how do they even know what codec you use? Because YouTube is then using its codecs to deliver. Yeah. They don't even know what the original video was uploaded with. And actually, I remember researching they, this. And they can't, they, only YouTube could tell them. It's actually really debatable what counts as personal use and whether or not like use in the camera and then transcoding counts or not. And basically it's just a nightmare. That it's just words that lawyers wrote somewhere, you know, because that's how they do. And it doesn't actually count and no one's ever tried to fight well, in court. And if they did, they'd probably get it their It appears a lot of that is because the licensing fees and royalties for these codecs were much less. If you were restricted from using them in commercial capacities, mm -hmm. the idea was that they charge the people who sell the studio camera way more money for the license, but mm -hmm. they can't charge that much for like dumpy thousand dollar mm -hmm. camcorder. Right. Well, there's also countries where like Europe, especially, yeah, Europe has, like has a war on video. A, a camera that can record video longer than thirty minutes is considered a professional video camera. So, and there's an extra tax on professional video equipment there. So, all these cameras that could otherwise record forever, for, but for no reason, have artificial limits in them that that force them to only record twenty nine minutes and fifty nine seconds in a single video. Yep, my and then uh, GH one has that or GX one has that problem. Then you have to push the video record button again. Yep. You know the Sony A seven, which is like one of the top video cameras, has that limitation everywhere in the world. But the Panasonic GH five, I think, has that limitation nowhere in the world. The GH four, they made different versions for different yep. parts of the world. You know, every all these all these crazy things. Because I think someone wants sure to the tax GX1, or charge or who knows what. Pretty sure there's only one version of the GX1 and it had the limitation everywhere. Yeah. Well, it's not a video camera. It just has, it's a camera that has video because every camera has video in the year 2017. Yep. I am thinking about just buying a legit studio camcorder because they're not actually that much money. And especially if we do our convention, all that stuff we're talking about, one of those would be way useful. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking into that. Do whatever you want. So it's your money. And some other, well, it might be the Patreon's money. No, <laughs> no, that's my beach money. Don't touch that. <laughs> so in other news, you might have seen that uh, there was a Pokemon Go Fest, and if you didn't see that, well, good job. I'm glad you avoided it. Uh, it was a convention for a single game, Pokemon Go. That A game single free-to-play, zero-skill game. That game is big enough still that they could have a convention and get people to show up. And not only that, but they had smaller, not super, you know, there's only one event in Chicago was actually endorsed and supported by Niantic, the company that makes, uh, you know, Pokemon Go. But there were other sort of semi-official, maybe real events around the world all yep. at the same time. And it was a disaster for the reasons that, like, I don't know how 
professionals everywhere, especially like nerd professionals at a game company, fail at this. They it sold out like right away. So they had a long time between when they sold their stupid tickets and when the event happened to plan for this. And at no point did anyone say, "Hey." What's going to happen if all these people show up in a park and try to use their cell phones? <laughs> and yeah, nothing worked. No one could. No one could play Pokemon Go Obviously. at Pokemon Go Fest. All the events that they had, they had to fake the results because no one could actually play mm -hmm. at all. And because it was in a park, they couldn't even do the kinds of things that like big convention centers or sports arenas do because those usually involve having Wi-Fi antennas up in the sky, pointing down in limited cones. You'd have to get, you know, uh, deployable equipment and spread it around. But the, the, the method that is the most effective at giving a large numbers of a large group of people in a small area service won't work if you can't put the antennas above them. That's right. That's, I've seen these things. I, like, I've seen, like, AT&T deploy these at, like, events. It's basically a box... Yep. And it has a generator in it, but it also plugs in, and it has this big stick coming out the top with a little thingy on it. And you basically bring a whole bunch of these to, like, a music festival or whatever, right? And they set them up all over the place, yep. and now it actually works. But you have to tell them this is happening, and they did not. So they could have, like, they, you know, if they were smart, they could have even, like, called, like, Verizon and T-Mobile. You know, and I think like, there's a difference, though. You know, and gotten, like, a partnership and a sponsorship. There is a very important they, difference. And they in set that up the thingies. Unlike normal events, this is an event where... Literally everyone is going to be using a lot of data on their phone the entire time. You think people are using a lot of data on their phone all the entire time at a music festival? I don't think 90 plus percent of them are at any given moment for the entire I, concert. No, but the number of people at the music festival is much larger. So yeah, I think the total were, usage uh, is This was be... bigger than most music festivals. How big was this thing? How, I, had, I had another what, website. What's the actual number on the turns, this? Well, it's only one day event. Mm-hmm. The point is, I'm pretty sure, right, they tell them how many people, they could have handled it, right, if they called them. They just didn't even think about it or do anything because they're morons. I actually don't think they could have handled it they're, because of how much data. I think it's, it's definitely possible. Because of how much data that game it's uses? It's just a fire Festival situation. People don't know how to run an event because there's so many things involved in running an event that you you need this extremely large body of knowledge to handle all these different areas from, like, first aid stations to, you know, fucking toilets. You got to handle, you know, this just vendors. You no, gotta, no, but here's, so here's the other thing. There's just food. They there's so much even, shit you got to handle. Scott, they didn't even who handle don't all that have, stuff. People, they didn't even handle the basic stuff. They literally... Right, just it was like, like a fire four, festival. It people, was like four... Well, people, no, fire festival was a scam. That wasn't a matter of not I'm planning. just saying, people running an event who don't do all the things necessary to run the event because they don't know all the things necessary because they don't have event festival. running experience. Fire festival didn't even do anything. That was just a scam. Um, pretty, they did some stuff. Well, they're, it, they're, I'm pretty event, sure it was just a mega An event up. wasn't even prepared. So, like, all their like all their stuff, like the rooms you could render over, were just fake. Like, it was just all fake. I don't think it was 100%. Percent fake. Uh, there, were, there were pictures of stuff. Yeah, I read a lot about the event. Also, the tumbling con with the with the with the uh, the the ball dash pit. Con? Ball pit. Oh, dash con was the, was what you're describing. It's dash just, con's a better example. They're all the same. They're all. It's basically all, an event. It doesn't have all the things an event needs. But and if you're missing, have... the thing is, if you have it a big event, if it's big enough, if you're missing even one thing, you just ruin everything. But you this need event to have was missing 100 percent of everything. the things. So there were four hour lines to get in because they never at any point considered. How they would get all these people into the park. No one, they knew the exact number of people would show up, and you can calculate how many people get the return style at a time, and they literally just they, they couldn't even make that happen. They didn't even think about it because they had no event running experience, and they didn't hire someone to help run the event or anything like that to, that would say, hey, you know, you need to think about how to get the people in the park. Like, it doesn't, you know, if you've never done something, it doesn't cross your mind the things involved in it. It's true for everything in the world. Someone goes into like a wood shop and they never made anything out of wood before. They just start doing it with no experience or studying or knowledge or preparation or help from anyone. And there's going to be so many things they overlook. They're just going to make this fucked up thing, throw it out and learn some lessons and start again. But if, but if that gather, first time you do it isn't some practice piece of wood where you don't care, it's the real deal with thousands of people... <laughs> That's a big fucking problem. The thing is, from what I can gather, they did have professional event people. I think it's just even people in this profession. Find out who those people are and don't hire them yeah. for your event because they're fuck-ups. But the moral is, there's a real fundamental moral here. And the moral is, don't ever make an event that relies on cellular networks or Wi-Fi, full stop. Mm -hmm. Because if you're at a large gathering of people, you must assume 
that the internet will not work. And if you are hosting a large gathering of human beings, you must assume that it will be an internet dead zone, even if it's in like the middle of Tokyo or something. I mean, look, the, 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 the Penny Arcade Expo <laughs> did once an Omegathon finale that involved Wi-Fi just on the stage. And it couldn't work. Mm -hmm. It could not work. And they knew exactly what they were doing. If they can't make it happen, no one can. However, that convention center now has perhaps the best convention center Wi-Fi I've experienced in However, my life. the method that it uses to provide that is a method that literally cannot be deployed in outdoor arenas. It can if you deploy a uh, many, many boxes that have long, tall sticks on them that aim down. Which I don't think has ever been deployed. That system I is see, a at music festivals. I've seen it with my own eyeballs. No, so the this the, is a thing they have. The, did you read the paper we linked to on the BCEC system? It's a stationary system. It's not the thing you're thinking of for music festivals. And to say you can deploy something that will give everyone service. The cones if you of know service it's coming. are tightly targeted to shockingly small geographic areas inside of the BCEC. Mm. Anyway, don't. If you went to Pokemon Go Fest, I don't know what you were expecting because it, what could possibly have happened? I mean, if you're then? a sad person who's so sad that you're playing Pokemon Go like that, you deserve what you got at Pokemon Go Fest. <laughs> Maybe it'll teach you to not waste your life playing Pokemon Go. Well, because it, I would. It, well, I mean, it has its purpose in that it got some people to walk around outside. I feel like I want to make a bad game that gets really popular, get everyone to come to an event, and then use the whole event to be like, "Look, this whole thing was a trap, guys." Isn't that just the plot of the wave, only with Nazis? Hmm. That's exactly the plot of the wave. Mm. Mm. So in some other news that people are shockingly mad about, Microsoft is killing MS Paint. So what? A lot of people are really mad about this. There's another. There's a new paint thing in my in Windows now that just old paint is also there. Also, well, there won't nothing, be anymore. The also, next update to Windows is removing MS Paint. So you know what? Right now, if you're upset about this, here's what you do: Paint is one file. Paint.exe. Even if you don't save your copy of Paint.exe, it is readily available on the internet. So Download funny, a copy of Paint.exe, put it like on your fucking desktop or whatever, and just double click on that motherfucker whenever you want some paint. So the most amazing thing is I was reading comments on Reddit, slash out, and people are actually mad about this. And the primary complaints are people who claim to use it professionally in their day-to-day -day work, and yet for whatever reason, like never thought to use a real application paint on net is free free zero dollars and they make ridiculous arguments about but my computer's locked down so i can't install anything quit your job get to go to a real workplace well if your job requires you to be able to draw terrible pictures then ask it and say i need to be able to use a paint program in order to do my job i cannot do it without a paint program you've removed ms paint give me a paint program also i realized or i cannot do i my realized job. pretty quickly a lot of the people complaining don't realize the snipping tool exists and has existed for a long time. And they use it, what they use MS Paint for, This, I think this is the majority use case, is they hit print screen and then they paste the print screen into MS Paint mm -hmm. and then they crop it because they literally have never heard of the snip tool that's been around for a long time. Yeah, you know what I do on my Microsoft Surface? Uh, I take the, the, the pencil and I click the eraser area because it clicks in. Yeah. And then this thing shows up on the right side of the screen, and one of them says screenshot sketch or something like that. So I touch it, and now it has a screenshot of my screen already in a paint thing, and I can doodle on it or crop oh, it or whatever. I did one better. Just hit the Windows key, type snip. Oh, yeah. I, I did the wrong one. But anyway, Windows key, snip, and you get the snipping tool, and you can literally just get an arbitrary screenshot. Yep. And you can doodle on it. Yep. And then I can copy it to my clipboard, That's or I can save it as a file. I can even email it, I guess, like directly. This is what ha people, many people, learn a way to do something. Yep. And as long as it gets the job done, people, except nerds, don't give a shit about efficiency. They really don't. Very few people care about efficiency or learning anything new. They, they have a way of doing a thing. They hate learning. So they keep. They want to be able to just keep doing things the way they do them for the rest of their entire life and never have to learn anything new ever. And that these are the people that I do not respect and would not hire and do not want to work with ever. So right? I could pretty much do job interviews and just be like, you know, would you be upset if there was a new way of doing a thing or like so test someone in some way to see if which kind of person they are and just hire all the, even if they don't <laughs> have any knowledge or skills, if they're the kind of person who wants to improve their way of doing things, I know that that person will be able to do any job pretty much. But the other thing is, from a like pure just software perspective, I think it's probably good because I would rather the OS like 
this doesn't seem like a necessary function of OSs anymore to have a draw pick a. I wish my my Windows drawing Windows, application I think built it's, in. I think it's a problem that Windows fucking comes with anything, right? It's like they pre-install all this garbage, right? And it's like you get all the it's like the Cortana and stuff. It's like give me Windows that comes with fucking nothing. That's called Linux. Uh, I'm just saying, right? That's called Linux. But they could make Windows that comes with absolutely nothing. No one wants that. I want that. I don't even want that. Because how many t- you inst- even if you clean install Windows these days, right? Clean install, you have to go uninstalling a bunch of shit. Like what? Like the, nowadays, if you installed Windows 10 recently, yeah, I, I removed some stuff. You gotta put like they, they put like the not only the Cortana, they put like Candy Crush installer, OneDrive. You know what? Please get Microsoft Office annoying thing. I turned, I uninstalled the Microsoft Office thing. The I whole really big care. fat start menu full of ads you gotta get rid of. Yeah, just let them be there. You just let the ads be there. You're just, I talk about ad block. You let ads in your start menu. Just let them be so there. So my start menu is up for. However long it takes to type the name of the application. I'm just saying. I just didn't even bother. I remove Are you that simple-minded that it bothers you that much? Oh, you're the person who says <laughs> block all ads ever is now saying it's okay to have ads? Yeah. In your fucking start menu? Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. Are these actually ads, though? What is an yeah, ad? Yeah, those are actually all ads, by the are way. Th- th- that, that picture of Geek Nights is an ad? There's a lot of ads in there. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> that's not an ad. There's, there are things in there that are not ads, but many of them are ads. But more to the point that... MS Paint really only it existed adds in the start menu itself because in the era unless you remove them before internet operating systems like a computer with nothing on it had to be amusing and reasonably functional even if you never ever put a disk in it installed software into right because there was no there was no anything. internet where would you go and get software from you had to go to the store and buy software and if you bought a computer and you just set it up and you turned it on if it didn't do Anything useful, it's like it's like an uh, old Apple computer you gotta put in a program and right. It's like uh what? But (laughs) like people would like you needed a bunch of games in a computer because an average family, most family members would have no reason to use a computer. So you pretty much needed to have amusements built in. But nowadays we don't need that. But you do need some other things, like you still need a web browser to come with the OS. It makes sense for a web browser to be built in. It should be Chrome, or it should turn on and let you choose which one you want, you know. Rather than including IE that you use. Actually, Windows today comes with fucking two web browsers, yeah. Edge and Internet Explorer. Jesus fucking Christ. Eh, that doesn't really bother me, though. It doesn't bother me, but it's like, are you serious? <laughs> well, remember. <laughs> really? 90- and you're just using one of them to install Chrome. So for a normal person? Actually, Firefox has improved a lot. 90% of what they do on a computer recently, is a browser. Very recently, like the past the, few weeks. And the other 10% of it is some sort of like email app. Mm-hmm. And for gamers, it's like... Twenty percent Steam, seventy percent browser, ten percent. I mean, once you got Steam and Chrome, like you're done. Yeah. Like, what else do you need? Unless you actually do things with your computer. I mean, I got Audition running. Adobe. Here. Uh, some people have Adobe stuff. Yeah. And then Steam and Chrome. I got OBS running over there. And Steam and Chrome. But yeah, people are shockingly mad about this, and I find that really funny. People get mad about fucking everything. That's how they do. Every time people get mad about some software changing, like Twitter redesigned, Ravel, Ravel, Ravel. This did it, Ravel, 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 and I go lol. Get with the program. Life is things are gonna change constantly for the rest of your life. If you're gonna rabble every time, just die already. Like what, so an, why? So another really quick news here. Uh Snopes, the website that uh, long ago told us whether or not there was rat meat in our chicken nuggets, if we were too stupid to just assume there isn't, mm-hmm. appears to be in trouble. But this could be fake. I need Snopes to tell me if it's not fake or not. But where would we check? <laughs> How do we know? Snopes uh, is still up right y- now. Yeah, you can read this. I'm not I'm not gonna we're not news, we're commentary. My hot okay. take is that I I don't think Snopes th- does not have good IT. If this is true and it is a hundred percent the people at Snopes are morons when it comes to fucking computers. Which, look they, at how that website have, looks. You I have, feel like that might be You the have case. no business running such an important website if you don't, if you just ha- let basically pay someone to take care of all your computer stuff. If they lost their DNS, uh, like, I really need Snopes to continue to exist because it's an important resource, but I have no sympathy for the people who own it losing their livelihood if they fuck up because they fucked up. But if they're in so much trouble, how are they about, like, the people who run their website holding them hostage, how have they been able to put the Save Snopes banner to donate on Snopes? Because they still have access to like the admin of Snopes CM, you know, in the CMS. Yep. But they don't have, it seems like they either don't know or don't re- like have access to like the DNS, the actual servers, you know, the anything like that. 
so they can't actually like you know do anything. So I got to guess. This is an uninformed, pure guess on my part. I suspect that they are dumb, and they did the Penny Arcade of accidentally sold their company or accidentally gave someone else rights, and that is the real problem here. Well, I'm sure. I feel like the people who run their website own part of the, like own the IP in some way to where. They are being extorted, and it's kind of their own fault. I mean, if but you... But that's a guess. This I don't is, know. I mean, I do know is that... Reg- I don't know anything about the legal aspect or who owns what, but the point is, if you don't know enough about technology and you have valuable technology, people who do know about technology can hold you ransom. Yep. And there's not really much you can do about it, even with legal rescores, because they just delete all your shit. Then what? Yeah, you've, it's tricky. You've got to hire someone. Oh, no, someone. Your, your law can't bring back the data. you got to hire someone who knows what they're doing, but you don't know how to vet the person. Right. What they should do is they should start by backing up their shit, and if they don't have backups, they should scrape that shit. Yep. And then just try to save your DNS. If you control your DNS record, you can just point it in new fucking servers, and you don't need to worry about your hosting company there. Just stop paying them. But I, just, I feel like... If we ever find out what happened back there, I imagine it's a really pathetic drama mess. Just from reading this, I can tell you the people at Snopes are not not guilty or not not negligent. Yep. And now we're not I'm not saying, giving them any money. We're not saying that the people allegedly holding them hostage, they might also they might be evil. Oh yeah, but it might I'm be still evil not giving incompetent. Yes, but I'm not giving any money to incompetent. I'd say let's just make Snopes. But the problem is I'm the com- value of Snopes is important enough that someone, as soon as this message went up, someone has already scraped it. So yep. I am, am not worried at all about losing the uh, the Snopes. But itself. the value of Snopes is primarily in the investigative journalism and the data, not the name or anything else right. at this point. Exactly. So they, they could even just start up a new site, Snopes Two, and as long as they didn't sell their trademark, then it, then they can call it Sepone Sin- or something. Yep. And just host all their recaptured data that they probably, you know, and whatever. So we'll we'll see where this goes. I am not donating money until I know what's going on. Oh yeah. yeah as much as I like Snopes, I do not trust. Donate the your money to the Internet Archive instead, who will archive Snopes. Yeah. And knows about and they know about computers very much. They are talented IT professionals at the Internet Archive. So this is your news, even uh, though you've asked me four times today what your own news is. Yeah, because I forget. So. Check this out. This is some VC garbage startup somewhere is making like, they're making some bullshit that's not going to work. You know, it's typical Silicon Valley nonsense. Get fucked. But what, but the, what they're doing is, is the kind of thing that could undermine open source consumer software. Yeah, they have this technique that, uh, that they're using to Which, market their shit. I'm not even going to say their name because it would market them. So what they're doing is step one, hire someone who is the maintainer of a popular open source thing. For example, they hired someone who is the manager of a plugin for the Atom text editor, which is the uh, text editor that's made by GitHub, I believe, and is a very popular text editor. So they hired someone who made a very popular plugin for Atom. And then, in hiring this person, they I guess they couldn't force them to do it, but I guess the person did it of their own free will. Possibly because a bunch of money showed up. Who knows? But th- this person worked for this startup, and then as after they were hired by the startup, they s- they merged in a patch into this plugin that effectively added what amounts to advertising for the startup they now work for. That would be like if I merged some, you know, I was working, I don't know. You work at Apache, and you merge, like, you just merge in all these, like, ads for Geek Nights into the comments of all the modules and scripts. Right. It's like, that's basically what they did. The, the details of the, this happened at least, there's at least two recorded incidents of this and perhaps more because uh, they only have so many employees, right? And th- those employees only have so many existing popular open source projects in their portfolios. But yeah, that basically means people are just innocently using this open source project, not realizing the person who maintains it was hired by an evil company and modified it. And now when they update, they get this evil update. Uh, so yeah, now... People who actually care about these projects have to go and like fork them, because depending on the license, and remove these evil patches. And also and find people to now be the maintainers, because the original maintainer is in the pay of the evil th- people. Exactly. So, and that maintainer, you can't trust any software they make ever, because they're a person with they basically, no ethics. They <laughs> lenovo at that point. Yep, that person, anything that that person works on ever, even after this startup goes out of business, which it will. Uh, is now a tainted person who now they're you doing cannot this. trust them. It seems like their plan is to do this as far and wide as possible. And from a cynical perspective, I mean, it's clever, 
because the kinds of people who maintain like these types of open source projects often need the money it, it's a and their salary is way cheaper than legitimate advertising now, it's a clever technique to market right it's like ooh, i wouldn't have thought of that but you're marketing you're making tools for developers right who are the smart people and now you're burning the bridge with the customer ah, right? but if it you would be further, smart if you could use this kind of technique to like let's say you hired the people who work on vlc i was about to say you then, move into the stuff that normal people use yeah then the people using vlc won't don't know any better right it's like oh there's an ad in vlc now god damn oh well right smart people will stop but most of the people using vlc don't know better yep. but if you're going for dev tools like the atom text editor or well, the python autocomplete which right. they also now people ruined. who set that shit up for developers who know better you're not fooling them but it does show a very a power a profound weakness in the open source movement as a whole in that some projects are important enough to the fundamental fabric of technology and the modern world, like the Linux kernel, that there is an, there is plenty of money and funding in people to keep it going well, and also, to resist these kinds of problems. Also, projects that are large enough like that aren't you know linchpin on a single person even yeah. if linus torvalds dies if linus or went or turns or, evil or greg koa hartman dies or turns yep. evil right it won't affect linux they will just kick that person out even linus torvalds can be kicked out of linux if he does if he fucks up too much right but imagine like so some the, really but, important apache module or something right we're, it's the vulnerability is in projects that have a lar relatively large number of users and a relatively small number of maintainers which could even be one maintainer yep and then that person that single person becomes compromised in some way and is now you know they're deploying software onto all these people's computers around the world the thousands of developers and it would also be a great way to start sneaking malware in if you were a bad person because the reality is most people who download open source software download binaries and run them without thinking about it or a lot of people do curl pipe <laughs> exec yep. i mean even if you compile it did you actually step through the code? No, you. Did. of course you didn't. No one does. Yeah, you can make a Python module and put it on PyPy, and if someone pip installs it, you can make a node module, put it on NPM, <laughs> and someone NPM installs it. You can make a, a deb and put it up somewhere, and someone can apt install it. And if they don't look before they install, you got them. But the weakness, you too, is that installing these yourself. are the kinds of projects where, you know, the economy is not great, and it doesn't look like it's getting better for the average person. Which, you know, obviously. Especially someone who's writing software in their spare time for free. Meaning that there's a lot of economic pressure on people who maintain these projects to either quit maintaining them to get a job that pays food money or to take money from this evil company. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll see how quickly this blows up in this terrible company's face. And we'll see if there becomes a trend of other people trying to ransom, hostage, or otherwise compromise open source software. Oh, this company will live as long as its VC funding keeps it alive, and then that will be it. Yeah. Just, I, like, I wanna, just like all other startups. I definitely do want to keep tabs on whoever funded this and uh, the point, make sure I avoid What you them. should do is look at all the open source software you use that's actually somewhat important. And go and if it's not a major project, like you don't need to worry about Vim, right? We know what, right? But if yeah. there's some plugin you're using or something, all right, go and check. Well, who, like you know what, who Notepad is maintaining plus. it? What the deal is with it? Like I use the hell out of Notepad plus plus to this day. That's fine. You can trust that, right? I'm pretty but, sure I can. Yeah, you can trust that. Uh, but like for now, you know, check the I guess heritage. What you know the uh, what's the word? The I don't I don't know. There's a word for it. There ends in edge, <laughs> right? For the provenance. Check the provenance yeah. of your... It's not an edge. No, it's not the provenage. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you should know the provenance of all of the, the, the little things that you're installing for free to make sure they're legit. Just check it's, them all once. And, well, and then, once if you check everything you use now once, then you can now easily check everything you add in the future. Another thing is... Well, if you work for a company, this is more important. If you are a company that uses mm. open source software... Someone's job should be to periodically vet the open source packages you're using. Yep, every t and then don't update them without checking again. Yep. Also, uh, another general rule that I follow that a lot of people don't is just minimize how much stuff you use. I see people they got like you know a million fucking plugins in their Vim and the Firefox and all these add-ons, and it's like I use as few as humanly possible, just because you you know you you keep your attack surface area down. Yeah. All right. I killed half a show. 
But anyway, things of the day. So in case I didn't drag Pokemon Go Fest enough from a like poor planning perspective, mm -hmm. this video is a supercut of how bad Pokemon Go Fest really was. It's someone just took actual promotional video that was filmed at Pokemon Go Fest, and it's great because you see these MCs who are clearly professionals trying to not react to the crowd as a crowd of bad an idea Pokemon Go Fest as a I, like as a concept was because of how non-interactive the game actually is. Mm -hmm. The fest, like you, if you watch this video, you'll see the kinds of events and the kinds of things they're doing. There's no content you can provide to people at an event like this other than like a place to hang out with the other people who do the thing because the game is not actually interactive in any meaningful way. Nope. And you see that by how desperately they had to stretch the kinds of events that they put on at the event and then had to fake the fact that none of the events actually worked. Mm -hmm. But to their credit, these people... Super pro MCs. Like, remember when we fucked up that late show and there's that moment where the two of us yep. look at each other for a second because <laughs> we don't know what to do? Mm -hmm. That never happens. They, like, power through it to the end. Bonus points for the fact that they keep trying to coin all this, like, pro gamer terminology around Pokemon Go, a game that has literally zero skill input. Mm -hmm. They they have these they have these phrases like savage season, which is a a technique you can use to one shot a Pokemon, and it's literally made up bullshit. And this one guy is like committed to acting like this is a thing real people say in the real world. Mm -hmm. It's just fascinating to watch. This I mean shit like this isn't new. Yeah, but this video is pretty. This video is a lot like all those long shots of the ball pit at Dash right, I got an actual technology thing of the day here. So, the first... Ram Today. People don't know how Ram Today works. Ram Today, at least as far as I'm aware, maybe things have changed since I learned about how Ram works, but as far as I know, SD Ram that we were using, like DDR1, it's still the same principle, just way, way, way better, is basically sort of a really fancy circuit breaker with really tiny, tiny breakers. No. And then you basically, just like the circuit breaker in your basement... Imagine just like a bajillion fucking tiny switches and they all go click, click, click. They're electronic, obviously, with no moving parts. Uh, but and back in the day, the first ever RAM, right? How the fuck did it work? We had vacuum tubes. That wasn't really RAM. That was the transistors of the vacuum tubes. And the computer would just compute. You had the input and the output. There wasn't a lot of storage besides a flip-flop. Right, which is a register. That's not RAM. RAM is like an, a memory that is external to the CPU that is addressed by the CPU and re read to and written from, written, written to and read from. Right, not a register that the CPU is using to compute. The first ever RAM ever was not the fancy circuit breaker DDR kind we have now. <laughs> <laughs> it was this thing called core memory. Which, right? if you look, there's a million videos about this. Like, you can make it yourself. Right. Like, or, it was mem or memory plane. And yeah, you can make some yourself. The way it works is you basically sew with thread, strings, a mesh. And on the vertices of the mesh are little donut magnets, tiny magnets that are donut shaped. And you send electricity through, you know, the edges, right, of the, you know, the on the side, through these strings, and the when, you know, you hit certain vertices with the electricity, the donuts physically flip around, like, bloop, 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 and from some of the side you can write, and some of the side you can read. You can flip the donuts, and you can read which way the donuts have, are currently flipped by, you know, seeing what comes out, and it was, the, the thing is, it was prone to error because physical donut things moving around. So you well, had it was, it lots and lots of error correction going on to avoid that. Uh, and sometimes the computer would crash if there was error and you had to start over. But, you know, it wasn't nearly as bad as it was before the invention of this stuff. So but, core memory was extra fascinating because the way you actually made it, there were never... By hand? Well, yeah, they, because there were never efficient machines to make it. And lots of people... Like in the in, during the Cold War, like the, the early fifties, their job was to basically knit RAM to use in computers. Right. So here's a video with a guy who worked on the team that made the RAM talking all about it. It's fucking fascinating, and he has the RAM and he can show it to you, and it still works today. Just slow as balls. Yeah. Slower than your hard drive with moving discs in it. S probably slower than like a 1.44 floppy drive. Yeah, definitely. Really, really slow. So. In the meta moment, the book club book was Dune. Frank Herbert's 
We finished it. The episode's up. Go listen. Enjoy. We talked about Dune. We're probably going to watch the Dune movie that's supposed to be hella bad. Yeah, we're going to watch the Dune movie and, and then, review it. Yeah, and then uh, I guess the new book club book is the fifth season. Not season. Season, right? As in a season like spring, winter, summer, fall. And then a fifth season after that. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> Stupid smarch. Yeah. That's a month. <laughs> that's not a season. This would be like... Uh, Falter. I don't know. <laughs> uh, by N.K. Jemison. This book is like the hot shit in the sci-fi fantasy genres of recent years. Uh, all her books are, but this is like the, seems to be the main starting point for this author. So that's where we're going. Yep, you can see I already bought it. I bought it when Scott announced it. He has to update the website, and we'll do it probably after the Prince of Nothing book comes out. Yeah, because Prince of Nothing is going to come out in tomorrow yep supposedly yep and we're gonna read that and then we're gonna start reading this book club book yeah uh otherwise are you so stuff? i should be starting the book club book in like three days probably yeah something like something that like <laughs> i'm pretty much gonna read the prison nothing like probably before that bike ride <laughs> like on the train up <laughs> i'm gonna read it in the tent while i'm waiting for the bike ride. yeah <laughs> so yeah otherwise uh like scott's youtube channel has a ton of stuff and my youtube channel has a ton of stuff and together they're like the entire canon of geek nights video except for a few videos that are orphaned on an account that for complicated reasons we can't access anymore but i'm just gonna scrape them all out and stick them on my youtube channel just so i can control them mm. and uh yeah otherwise uh the next convention we're gonna be at is PAX West, the mothership. The real PAX. The, the tickets are PAX. in the... My friend just got his tickets in the mail. Mine might be in my mailbox right the fuck now. I booked my flights today. Oh, I booked them a while ago. Yeah, you know what? Delta was actually cheaper than JetBlue. I feel like I've been booking flights too early, and I could save money by booking later, so I'm going to start booking later. I'm I, waiting for PAX South flights. I didn't book them yet. PAX South is way too soon. Yeah, I'm going to wait. I, I read, my go-to is for domestic flights, two months. For international flights, three months. I read, a, I read a few things online. I couldn't tell if they were true or not, but I figured there's no reason not to at least give them a shot. They said 47 days is the ideal time so 47 days before PAX South, I'm going to go try to buy tickets and see yeah. what the price is. I mean, and I said alerts. If they're, like if they're higher than they were before, oh, well. And if they're lower, oh, okay. I guess they weren't lying to me. I actually do use Kayak mostly because I found that at least for a while, I mean, I can't, I'm not saying I endorse them and, you know, those kinds of sites come and go all the time. But right now they're the ones I use because I book a lot of flights mm. and I've had pretty good luck with them. Like I, they've never overcharged me and I pretty much always find the best option. I've used it before. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's a little janky the way it works, but it works. Well, the problem is I always have to uncheck EWR because I'm, I'm not flying out of Newark. Fuck yep. you. Yep. And I have to uncheck like Gatwick because I'm not flying to Gatwick if I'm going to London. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, actually, you know, if the flight is like a serious enough flight and you're saving enough money. No, it's you're never true. You can get to EWR not too badly. I would have to save at least it, $500 you, before I would even consider going to EWR. Uh, no, because it doesn't cost $500 to get there and back. Uh, to, to, get to, to get to Newark, it only costs like an hour of your time. An hour if there's minimal traffic. I no, would, what do you do? I'm a traffic. Dude, but the last time I flew Jersey to Newark, Transit goes there, and all at 24 hours a day, Jersey Transit will take you there. The last time I flew to Newark for, for a work trip, I took a cab. Actually, like why'd you take service, a fucking cab? Because the company just set it up for no, me. No, you can take Jersey Transit to get to Newark 24 seven. So no matter when your flight is, you can get there. Also, Penn Station Penn is so Station. fucked right now. I wouldn't trust that because like it depends when your flight is, right? If, you're, yeah. if your flight involves a rush hour trip, maybe not. But if your flight is like, oh, get to eat, get to Newark early, crack of dawn on Saturday. It's but like, Newark oh. is also just like the times I've flown there. It just kind of sucks. I mean, it's not as bad as LaGuardia. Don't get me wrong. No, but LaGuardia is the, LaGuardia the is, is the worst. But I, at least I can basically walk there. So yeah. that's like, well, I guess okay, I'll go here so, occasionally. Uh, sixty-six percent of the time that I have landed at LaGuardia in the last year, I have walked out of the airport because transit was fucked and there was no other way out. Mm. And I feel real bad for people who don't have that luxury. Mm. <laughs> and it actually, it's a pretty nice walk. Like, you walk out of LaGuardia, and eventually you get on, like, you know, th there's a couple streets you can take back I've ta toward my home. When I've landed at LaGuardia, I usually take a cab home, and I've been lucky that that has worked. Yeah, two of the times I've landed there recently. I have, I have now learned how to use the select bus service, so I'm going to try it. Yeah, the one time I had trouble there, the traffic was so bad, the select bus couldn't get into the airport. I learned how to use select bus. I'm so I it. walked out, and I caught the local bus that go does kind of the same route from outside the airport. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, to the main bit. So this topic, I think, is worth 
I Talk feel like about? we've talked about this so many times, it feels like, either in news bits, and also we did an episode on it. We, it feels so like we've talked, we every, he's already said everything we got to say, but but it's important enough that we could say some more. Also, some like some things have legit changed in this topic in the last year. Like, mm. there is, there are changes to best practices regarding passwords, and... The last show we did, where we definitely talked about this as the main topic... It was two years ago, which is not that long ago, actually. But we called it, Don't Share Your Password, and it I'm appears, sure that in the discussion of passwords, we said everything there is to say about passwords. But I th- I feel like we mostly talked about all the people who like have... They share passwords with each other, which, and I think that is like really common practice now. Do not the, do. All the streaming services. Never do. Even though, as I say that... Uh, for a long time, we were logging into Emily's parents' Crunchyroll account because yeah. they shared their password. Mm. But I just have my own account now because mm. I didn't that, that that was not maintainable. That that a lot of reasons. But obviously, don't share your passwords. Don't make your password hunter too. But NIST, which is an organization you can the National much trust, Institute for Standards and Technology or something, something like that. Yeah, uh, they issue guidance for things. Is a good way to describe them. Yeah, technology and science things. And they've changed a lot of the best practices around how you should manage passwords. So I think we should do a quick refresh on, in 2017, how should you deal with your passwords? And the answer is not to use a service where you give them your passwords and then they log into your sites for you. All right, well... To give people credit, using one of those services, like LastPass or OnePass or whatever those fucking things are. I think LastPass might be the safest one. I don't know. I don't know which one's good and which one's bad because I don't use any of that garbage. But they're better than the regular, whatever, you know, they're better than like doing nothing and doing some crap. Yeah, if you're bad at passwords, definitely use something like LastPass. It's way safer than whatever garbage you're doing now. Right. It's like, it's got its problems. I wouldn't trust it. But... It's like for your mom, it's like if your mom is just going to like make her password like the name of the pet uh, with like a number after it. Yep. Then your mom would be helped by LastPass. It's still better than that. So, okay. But otherwise, if you actually have anything you care about protecting for real, like your Steam account that has thousands of dollars worth of games in it. Yep. Do not use this. Oh, God. YouTube in the background is just looping terrifying Stu Leonard's animatronics on this tab. Okay. (laughs) Anyway. Right. So the reason that they are bad is some of them are like storing your passwords encrypted in the cloud somewhere. So now it's theoretically possible someone could like get your passwords because they're stored somewhere. It depends. Even now if your on... passwords are only stored on your computer, they're stored. They're written down. They're in a place where they can be stolen from. The passwords should not exist anywhere other than your brain. So think of it like, your brain. say you've got 20 keys to all the different buildings you go into on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. What these password services do in the best case scenario is they give you a box and you put all your keys in that box and then you lock that with one key. Mm-hmm. And then because physical analogs don't work, that one key now magically has the properties of all those other keys. Mm-hmm. Meaning if someone steals that one key, they can get into all your buildings instead of just the mm-hmm. one. All right. So what should you do? Well, if you, I've said this before on the show for sure, but if you have something super secure and super important, you need the best password, there's a thing called diceware, and that's what you should use. You roll some fucking dice, and it brings you up a big-ass long sentence full of words. This protects you from random number generator it's attacks, easy, it's relative, from keylogger attacks. It's relatively easy to remember. Well, I guess not at use keylogger attacks, but at, cre- at generation keylogger yes, attacks. It, ge- it will generate for you an amazing password that is super secure, that is relatively easy to remember compared to its secureness, and you just have to remember it, and it's awesome. And yeah. so anything you really care, I'm gonna, I'm been slowly trying to convert every single password to Diceware, uh, but you know I have so many passwords, it's sort of an ordeal. Yeah. Uh, so here's other things that I use right now that are pretty good, right? So I use a thing called. Uh, Super uh, Super Gen Pass. Oh yeah. So Super Gen Pass, the way it works is you remember one password in your brain only, right? And you might be going, "Oh no, I'm typing my password into this shady website." But no, I've looked at the source code for Super Gen Pass because it's not that complicated. There's not that much in there. And it's 100 percent JavaScript. It runs totally on your computer and sends nothing anywhere, right? And the way it works is you type in your password, and then you type in 
the domain of the website you need the password for, and it uses math that I'm not going to explain to combine that one password you remembered with the domain of the website to generate a unique password for that website, and that's the password you actually use on that website. Meaning, even if you're using the same password in your brain, and say that website just stores your password clear text and their server gets compromised, the password that was stolen is literally worthless. It's on not any other website. Yep. And if I can, I mean, you're effectively using the same password on every website. You have to remember the one password, but you're actually using a different password on every website. And all you need is this little bit of code and the domain names to sort of combine the password you remember with the domain to get the real password to log into that site. Yep. Now, your passwords are not stored anywhere. No one can like find your password by like stealing some files or decrypting anything or anything like that. If they, if they break into that website, well, they broke into that website, but your account is you know, going to be fine, right? Now, no. I actually do something very similar, but I just do it in my head. I have an algorithm I can follow in my head based on... I'm sure it's less mad mathematically rigorous oh, of course it's than not. some fancy hashing. It is definitely not, but... I feel like it's sufficient. I mean, we've talked about it's this. It's probably like, sufficient. The level. It doesn't take much. How crazy you are about passwords and security and all these things, you know, OPSEC, is just, look, what's your level of paranoia and what's your level of acceptable risk versus mm -hmm. convenience? Yeah. Another thing I use is called Password Card. Password Card's real good. I, I so, recommend this to anyone who I think is too dumb to use a more technological solution, right, but so, smart enough to realize that they need a solution. So the way Password Card works is you go to this website, Password Card, and you randomly generate a password card, right? And they've made mil hundreds of thousands of password cards. And then you print it out, and it prints you this nice little card with symbols and numbers all over it, right? And then you go to a website, and you need a new password, or you, you got a new account, you need a new password. You look at your password card, and you say, which combination of these weird symbols am I going to use for the password for this banking website? Maybe I'll start at the dollar sign and go down to the right diagonally, and then back up in a V-shape, and I'll use those symbols, right? Okay. I've never gone that complex with my password card usage. I'm just saying that's an example, right, of something you might do. And you remember because the bank website to start at the dollar sign and to go in the V shape because whatever, you just have to remember that little bit. You just have to remember a smaller piece of information, which is where on this password card is my password, which is easier to remember than the actual crazy password full of symbols and nonsense. And then... You pull out your password card and you look at it and it's like having your passwords written down on a paper. But unlike having your passwords written down on paper, no one can take the paper and figure out your password because they take this paper and it's a fucking jumble of nonsense. And they don't know where on this piece of paper your password is. It's just a jumble. It, no, means, nothing, time, it means nothing to nobody except you. If you use it naively... It gives people a bunch of low-hanging fruit guesses as to what your password is. Yes, are. if you're like, oh, well, my password to the banking website is start at the dollar sign and go straight down. Yep. Don't do that. But here's the more. <laughs> this is where we're going to deviate from the shows we've done in the past. This, in particular, is a good case study because it still generates the kind of entropy-focused, unintelligible passwords that hitherto have been considered secure. And NIST has issued updated guidelines, and basically the best practices today are to not use passwords like this, and instead to use uh -huh. passphrases, uh -huh. because that way you don't need a token, it goes back to being what passwords originally are. Something that literally only exists in your brain, and only comes out of your brain when you're entering it to authenticate. Yep. So what NIST has basically they've issued a whole bunch of guidelines, and these were earlier this year, and there's been a lot of debate about it, but the idea is that... Humans are not good at remembering a random string of uppercase and lowercase ridiculous characters, and you'll actually generate more entropy by just typing a very long password that consists of words. Yeah, if you just have a ton of lowercase letters, think about it. You know, okay, so one character, right? So you're using 26 letters of the alphabet. Okay. Up, yep, uppercase or lowercase. And you got eight characters. So eight times 26, well, 26 to the eighth power possibilities. Yeah. That's a lot of possibilities, but not for a fucking computer. It's no. not. No, no, no. So you could increase the number of characters you allow. Allow hyphens, question marks, plus, minus, divide. Okay. So now it's 40 to the eighth power. Okay. 
How much bigger is 40 to the 8th power compared to 26 to the 8th power? And you really can remember T, uppercase V, U, that weird double S squiggly, right. underscore, underscore, 91184, yeah. uppercase T. You know what? If you, L1, I, 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 if you L. just take 26 to the 9th power, the 10th power, the 11th power, the 12th power, your complexity is going to increase much, much more rapidly than it will allowing more characters, right? So just between uppercase, lowercase, and space, you've got 53 characters, I guess, right? Yep. You don't need to include anything else. 53 characters to the very long sentence that has, you know, five five-letter words. That's now 50-something to the 25th power, and all you yep. have to remember is a sentence with five words and in it. And let's like, say... Let's say you stuff you remember. Like, let's say I'm really into Tolkien. So I use a really long, like I use a Tolkien quote. You can write, looky mighty, right? <laughs> and it's like, looky mighty is already a great password because it's like a ton of letters. But if you write the whole fucking thing, like, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. That's hella long. You can always remember that. Look, I just quoted it. And nobody's guessing that in a million fucking years. Yep. That is super secure password. I feel like if they Unless someone your name me, is Rim and that's what people are going to guess. Yeah, people would guess that day one. <laughs> but if you're... <laughs> that's like guess number three. If your name is not Rim, no one's guessing that. <laughs> yep. So NIST wants everyone to increase the maximum length of passwords to at least 64. That sounds good to me. Which is... Perfect. Now, I'd, I'd like to see longer. What sentence are you not... Yeah, why not 128, 256? Well, because right now... You got a memory. Lot, a shocking number of sites limit you to, like, 16. Yeah, that's awful. Which is not enough, because, actually, the passwords that I use today that I algorithmically generate, I decided not to use passphrases because so many things I log into don't let me have long enough passwords for that. Yep, that's a super problem and I'm, I'm not having right now. And i two systems. That's the number one thing keeping me from 100% diceware, besides laziness, is a lot of sites... I can't because they don't allow my password to be that long. So another for one no reason. is to have no composition rules. Do not require people to use uppercase and lowercase. Right. Do not require numbers. Do not require symbols. Because think about this. If you have a, let's say you have a, a, a two-letter password, right? And you require uppercase. Well, now you've actually just decreased the possibilities. The, yep. ser the search space of all legal passwords is now smaller. Yeah. If you might... It's like, sure, even if you get up to 8, 12 like imagine, characters. Imagine a padlock that has three digits on it, and you have a rule that says no two digits can be the same. That makes it way easier to figure out your pick combination. Yeah, they just removed a lot of possible combinations. So even though you might be allowing someone to have a stupid password, like password, uh, that still forces the person who's trying to guess the password to go through every possible guess. They can't just eliminate all these guesses. Like, oh, this one doesn't have uppercase. Don't even try it. This one doesn't have a number. Don't even try it. Right? So they basically say have a minimum mm -hmm. and have a very high maximum. Yep. And the minimum minimum is eight now, which is fine. Eight is good, but it sh I'd make the minimum like 12. Yeah, I would make the minimum higher. Yeah, but 16 I, even. So I'm on this website that I think is a summary of some of the NIST uh, guidelines. And but make sure you allow spaces because that's what allows phrases. They say it very succinctly here. Favor the user. Make your password policies user-friendly to put the burden on the verifier, not the password user. Mm -hmm. And the verifier is not going to have any more or less trouble with a long quote from Tolkien than it will from a long string of unintelligible characters. That's right. Uh, so, you know, the basic dictionary stuff, but the no composition rules is a big problem because so many things require ridiculous bullshit in their passwords. Mm -hmm. And that's like... As a result, I still, like, my... Not everyone's following these guidelines. In fact, few people are following these guidelines. I have had, let's just say in a professional capacity, uh, large, very well-funded institutions that require this bullshit. You know who has really, really awful password practices? Amtrak? American Express. Yep. American yep. Express oh forces God. you to use a tiny garbage password. Yep. And it's like, for something that should be very, very secure, your fucking money... Don't use American Express. <laughs> uh, uh, so Amtrak, for a long time, I don't know if it's changed, because I still use my weird old password there, had so many requirements that I could not make any of the algorithms I used to generate passwords work with it. So I basically, for a while, made a throwaway password and did an email password reset every time I had to log into their site. That's not a bad system. In fact, for a while... That's basically two-factor. Right, Mozilla That's was... That's like bullshitty two-factor. Mozilla was using was developing this thing uh, that they that I was going to use, but they, they closed it because... Uh, it was called Persona, I think. Yep. And it, it, they closed it because it didn't get enough traction. But actually, I thought it was going to be great because basically what it did is it did exactly that. It's like, oh, well, password 
you know, email reset is the thing. So what we'll do is we'll just, when you log in, we send you an email, you go to the email and click, and now you're logged in for as long as the cookie lasts, and that's it. No bothering with stupid passwords. Just email, email the thing only. If that lets you reset, why not just let it lo- have it log you in? And then it also included some fancier ways to let you log in because the idea would be that you would, you know, open ID was the was now also now dead, which would be oh, I, I had an open ID. Yeah, and it's tied op- to a YubiKey that no longer works. Yeah, open ID was a thing for a while. The until, old YubiKey until the login with Google, login with Facebook, login with Twitter, OAuth took over instead. Yep. But the idea would that be you would be log into you would set up your own sort of auth server with you know sort of open ID way, log into it with the persona in an open ID fashion with the email. So no, you didn't even type in a password. All you did is you guess you log in, you did your email. You click the thing, you're logged in, and then when you go to other websites, that uses OAuth to connect you in. So you never have to type a password anywhere, and you just log in everywhere with your one persona login at that one place that you completely control. Yep. And that never came to be. So some of the other guidelines, and these are more for people who are developing auth systems, never allow people to use password hints, nor require them looking at a lot of websites. Yep. How You go to Win, even Microsoft Windows, yeah. you can have a password hint on the screen. And it made me type something. Yeah. I, I typed the word fuck, and I just left it there at work. <laughs> I just type, I forget what I type. I just type whatever. Yeah. Nothing, nothing helpful. <laughs> right? Uh, Knowledge-based authentication is obviously a terrible idea. This is usually a problem with password recovery. Like, what was the name of your favorite pet? What's your mom's middle name? It's what like are a bunch someone of things? Can, some, someone can find out my mom's middle name, so I don't actually type my mom's middle name there. I type something else. Yep. So if someone finds out, you know, they can research and find out my mom's middle name or my, you know, pet's name or what school I went to. So I always put something else there, uh, which is helpful. But probably the most important one, uh, if you run a system, never people, never require people to change their passwords and never expire passwords unless like my work, which expires them all the goddamn time. Oh my god! Don't even get me started about some LDAP nonsense I've been dealing with recently. Yeah. But two, if you are a user of passwords, which I hope you are. Don't just rent the don't change your passwords regularly. Pick passwords and use them unless you have a reason to change them. Like a site was compromised. Yeah, if you change your passwords frequently, you're more likely to forget them and have trouble. Mm-hmm. And if you're more likely to forget them, you're more likely to use a less good password, right? If you if you have some super long sentence but you type it 100 times a day every day forever, you're going to remember it forever. It's going to stay secure forever. Yep. It's the, the, the math means they need like a billion years to guess it until a quantum computer is invented. So don't you don't have to change it except for every billion years. <laughs> now, I guess the important gist of this is that all the things you should do to make your passwords better are not really supported by a lot of the things people need to log into, mm-hmm. which is a problem. Well, a good thing you can do, for example, is like I was talking before about the login with Google, login with... Twitter, login with Facebook. Yep. A lot of those places, like Google, will allow you to have the real deal password. Yep. And My with- Google password, which is the literally the most important password in the world, right. is so, a really long password. So use those things if you have the opportunity, because then even if some website is real shitty and doesn't have good password policy, you don't need a password on that website. Just log in with Google, and since your Google's safe, your, web, your account on that site is safe, and you're good. You don't need a password there. Yep. So the other interesting thing is that, I mean, we've talked about two-factor before, and obviously you should use two-factor wherever possible Mm -hmm. because the concept of passwords in a real secure environment is increasingly obsolete because while it may be a token that only exists in your brain in an ideal world, the reality is they are trivially compromised by key loggers, malware, high-resolution cameras. Right. It's always possible that someone could still get my password. What if like, someone's in one of the... you know, I'm not going to close my window every time I type my password, right? Maybe somebody in an adjacent building gets a super long zoomy lens and zooms into my fingers and records in slow-mo high def and they see me type in the password... It's like there are ways to get someone's password no matter how fucking good the password is if you're going through enough effort. So if something is secure enough and valuable enough, that more likely someone is to go through with the effort to get that password and they can get it. Yep. So, so thus, were you factor. in Starbucks with the security camera typing your password on your laptop? Yep. Oops. What did I say the other day? If you live in a building that has a doorman or work in a building that has a doorman, that doorman probably knows the unlock code to everyone's phones. 
Because yep. what do you do when you're in an elevator? You open your phone and look at Twitter for the 30 seconds it takes. Yep. And you might say, oh, but I use an iPhone. I use the fingerprint. That's even easier to get. Yeah. Touch? Did you touch anything? Mm-hmm. <laughs> in fact, I only if use, I steal your I have phone... It, I have it set to where the fingerprint will only open it after a very short locking period. Yep. After a long locking period, like I actually put the phone away, I need to type a password again. Yep. Not some pin, not a swipey thing with lines, Android. Actually typing in a real password on the phone. Da, 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 da. Yep. Because uh, what do you touch your phone with primarily? Probably your thumb or your fingers. Uh, your fingerprints are all over your phone. And I've seen, there's been many proofs of concept of extracting those fingerprints, printing a 3D model on rubber or something, and then just right. opening a phone. Right. But anyway, you need the two-factor because someone can get the password, but to get the password and to also get a physical thing that you possess in your possession is very, very difficult, yep. right? Oh, they zoomed in with the zoom lens and they saw me typing in the password. The security camera at the Starbucks recorded my password when I was typing it in. And they don't have my phone because I own it. It's in my hand right now. They didn't rob me and mug me. Oh, the mugger mugged me. He's got my phone, but he didn't. He's not the same person who stole my password. Yep. So you, to do both things, it, the level of difficulty there is so high. And the things that you, a Geek Nights listener, have are so not valuable that it's so not worth it. Yep. And if you have a two-factor, you safe. You, so, you very safe. As an aside, not 100% safe. But so safe. One of the other changes is that they have formally obsoleted the idea of using SMS as a second factor. SMS looking at, does looking not at you, count. looking at you, Twitch and uh, yep. fucking Twitter, yep. and fucking Tumblr. Fuck all you, dude. Support OAuth. I have a YubiKey. Let like, me let me use my fucking you know Google Authenticator app. I have you. I can literally plug my YubiKey. I have a physical token. I plug into USB. You can't it's plug awesome. it into your phone. Uh, you can if you get the RFID one. You don't have the that NFC one. one. You don't have that one. I could get that one. Understand. Actually, you can do three factors. So there is a way. If you have an Android phone, it won't work on iPhones because Apple won't let them. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of dumb reasons for that. But you can get a token, a physical like token that has RNG stuff in it yep. with NFC, mm -hmm. and you use the Google Authenticator app on your phone and a password. The Authenticator app. Can't generate the numbers unless, unless you, have you the hold RFID the thing. token against your phone. If I ever have a company, everyone has to do that. Yeah, that would be <laughs> that would be like if the company if the kid company did anything that mattered. Yeah, and I'm it, not going to do that. I'm not doing that for our convention. No, I'm talking about for like the bank or yeah. the you know expensive shit. Yep. Uh, so, uh, but they you can SMS does not count as two factor. Right now, you might think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's wrong with having someone just text me the code? That's the same as emailing me the code, right? Yeah. No, it's not, and this is why. I'm using Gmail, right? Yep. In order for someone to get in that Gmail, they, they gotta need Google. They need the really good password and the, the and the Google Authenticator app for my phone. They ain't getting in there to get my email. Or they have to break into Google's nonsense. Good luck breaking into actual Google and all that shit's encrypted on their servers anyway. Yep. Good luck. So, so SMS one. What happens? What if they, someone sends me a text message? It's not encrypted. That text message can be spied upon on the network, especially if I'm getting wi text over Wi-Fi or something, right? Like using iMessage or who knows what. Now, that is a obscurity because it's a, like sniffing that kind of traffic is a giant pain in the ass. But it's possible. Yep, and it's and, not and, even and, that and, hard. And that text message doesn't originate like on some phone system. It originates on the internet, and then it only hits the phone system like near the when it gets close to me. And that whole area, it's unencrypted and snoopable on the internet. Right. Not only that, but it has been proven that the customer support services at all of the phone companies in the United States, especially, but also probably other places, are very susceptible to social engineering. I could trivially, with what I know about my friend, say, Rim, call his phone carrier, T-Mobile, which I know because I'm his friend. Yep. And convince them that this phone I just bought is Rim's new phone. And they should begin to send all of Rim's phone calls, phone number, and text messages to this phone that I just bought at the store. And that Rim's phone was lost, stolen, fell in a toilet, something like that. And if that. this seems implausible, I had to call T-Mobile a while ago because my data plan literally stopped working. Mm -hmm. SMS worked, but data didn't. And at no point when I was like changing sims did i have to prove my identity to anyone so i'm sitting there trying to log into rim's tumblr and it says oh by the way we just texted you a message for auth 
Uh, and I go, oh, Rim's using two-factor. Let me just take this spare phone I have, call T-Mobile, get Rim's number ported to my phone in 10 minutes, and then log into, T log into Tumblr again. And okay, now the OAuth, was, the message was sent to this phone, and I logged in, and the two-factor was worthless. Now, the some people, multiple people, when I was talking about this, back when this guidelines, like the, the request for comments period was going on, had a counter-argument, and their argument was, yes, SMS two-factor is insecure, but for the majority of people, it's one, better than nothing, and two, by deprecating it, you're harming all the people who are too poor to have a smartphone. Uh, you should be sending your, you, first of all, they're very, very inexpensive smartphones available these days that are cheaper Smartphone, than, yeah. that are cheaper than flip phones. Like, to get a phone that can run the Google Off app, you can get- You don't a, even need data. You can get iPhone 1. Remember, the Google Auth app does not need data to work. You can get iPod Touch. It generates the codes on the phone. You can get some old, they should, Google should just make little tiny things that do the Auth app, and yep. that's all they do. And two, they'd be like five bucks. I would argue that giving someone a false sense of security is way worse than them just having bad security. Uh -huh. If you think the door to your house locks and you don't realize that like literally anyone could open the door and only you don't realize this, that's way more dangerous than you being afraid that someone's going to open your door at any right. moment. Right. If you have a door with no lock on it, it's like, all right, well, at least I know I'm not safe. I'm going to sit here with my shoddy. Yeah. But if you have a door you think is locked and you go, doo -doo 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 -doo, <laughs> I'm told no one can get in this safe. It's fucking Fort Knox. And then someone walks the fuck in. You're a shoddy across the room now. Imagine you're pooping in a public bathroom and you think the stall is locked and someone just opens it and is standing there and pees on you. Yep. Which happened to a friend of mine at band camp. But if you see the lock it was is dark. Not, if you see the lock is clearly not functioning on this stall and all the other stalls are occupado, you can hold that shit close with your finger. <laughs> you got options when you know. You gotta be in the know. So people they gotta know if you use the text message off, you at least gotta let people know so they can hold that close with their finger. So my advice to you, just so we have a moral, because we gave you a lot of advice that a lot of websites won't let you actually do, is other than all the stuff like two Do the best you before, can do, yep. wherever you can do it, to the best of your ability. Use and, passphrases that don't expire and, anywhere you and can. And do things that are relative according to the value of what you are protecting. And if something you didn't put full effort into protecting is stolen... Oh, deal with it. That's your own fault. And if you're in charge of Prime a system, a lot of you work in IT. That's probably why you're listening to Geek Nights Monday. Yeah. Uh, Follow these guidelines. Yeah. Don't force stupid passwords on your users. Don't expire their passwords. And if your boss, uh, if some, if you have some stupid boss who's making you do something stupid, give them the NIST the, document. Show them the guidelines. Be, Be like, like, this is what the government says to do. Nah. This is what the DOD probably, at least I hope, does. Yep. This is the this is more secure than what we have. You just don't know anything about security. This is what experts say. We're doing what the experts say. If you don't think I'm an expert, that means you don't value expert knowledge. In which case, you should quit that job immediately. Yep. And in fact, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some uh, extra credence. Scott, had, like his job is legit, right? I've been, Scott should know security. Otherwise, like a big website would be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but you've never had a problem. One of my formal roles at my current company is doing risk analysis and part of that includes writing and auditing security procedures i am like i legit am in charge of that stuff for a company and i do it and i research it and, and you've I had zero it. incidents yeah well yeah I, I can say this any incident <laughs> you had an incident <laughs> any incident that has ever happened has been due to someone not following a procedure or circumventing something. And the remediation, of course, is prevent circumvention or force people to follow procedures, but... Fire people. I would have zero tolerance for failing to follow... That's the one thing. It's like, if I had to work, you know... People, I, whenever I talk about, like, yeah, if I was a boss, I'd be like, a million well, vacation here, days, I la lazy time on the beach, yeah. not giving a shit, take as much time for lunch as you want, right? Laziest workplace. But if it, we were doing important work that had value... The only thing I would be an asshole about as a boss would be security stuff. Yep. And if you fucked up a security procedure, I would just have zero tolerance and fire you because you're a threat to the company. Well, on the same token, there's a difference between negligence I'd and... educate you in advance. Yeah. I'd do lots of education up front. I wouldn't just, you know, but... Well, there is a difference between, say, negligence and gross negligence, for example. Sure, but, like, if someone just leaves the fucking door open or yeah. doesn't lock their computer when they stand up... Oh, well, if right. someone doesn't lock their computer and they stand up, Goatsy is the appropriate punishment for that. That's correct. Mean, that, <laughs> but that's that, punishment that, enough. But that's also sexual harassment in the workplace. Okay, uh, let me, what, what can we use? 
I'm sure I could come up with an, with a appropriate similar punishment. A leak spin that doesn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, passwords. And I'm hungry, so we're just gonna stop. I'm hungry. Boop.